Welcome to the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm V.S. Holmes, and with me today is Summer Brooks, host of Slice of Sci-Fi and Writers After Dark. Thank you so much for joining me. You're very welcome. It's uh, kind of interesting to be on the interviewee side <laughs> of the microphone. <laughs> I, I think it's probably easier to be the interviewer most of the time, in my experience. I think so, too. Um, I just, I just, I love talking to the creators, uh, you know, the, the movies, the TVs, the books, the audio books, mm -hmm. and just getting their perspective on what it was like to create that piece of work or be a part of that creation of that piece of work. Because I have questions about creativity and production of creativity and you know, story ideas and molding those stories into something coherent that other people will understand. And I love, especially if it's a story that I love or a story mm -hmm. that intrigued me from, I mean, even, even some of the worst movies out there have a little tidbit, a little smidgen of creativity that goes, that makes you go, wow, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even even on awful, awful horror movies, I try to find that little bright spot. And sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think it might be easier <laughs> with, with horror because I, it has a way of sort of leaning into the campiness of the genre that some other genres, I think, shy away from or a little maybe it's less embarrassed by its source material. Oh, the 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 ones that were intended to be humorous definitely go there. That's true. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there are other movies that are intended to be serious but come off a little flat because they're you know they you know swung and missed at the wrong time mm -hmm. but for the most part for me with horror most horror movie creators are anxious to explore something mm -hmm. dark so they're not really afraid of that darkness at the beginning Right. Maybe something, you know, if a story doesn't work, I sometimes wonder if, okay, did that person just stop going deep enough to, into what this made for them? It Did their budget get in the way? What, <laughs> you know, what happened here? Because this mm -hmm. was a good premise and the execution kind of missed. But either way, it's, it's, they got it made, which is more than 99% <laughs> of the people out there. I mean, That's even, good. even the lowest low budget horror or science fiction or thriller movie or short film i mean there have been some amazing stuff on on web series on short films oh, as well and they got that thing made and put mm -hmm. out to the world so that accomplishment alone is something i i liked theater you know in in high school but i i liked sort of being more behind the scenes myself but I was a part of a little local, like a friend's brother-in-law was putting together a little film and it was a sort of ghost hunters-esque thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, it's a guy in his basement with a computer um, and, and then a, a camcorder and we still were able to, to pull it off and it was really fun. Um, I mean, the acting is is atrocious except for like maybe one exception but <laughs> and, and by the way it wasn't me I, I was not the exception <laughs> but it was just so much fun to to do and I think there's really something great about creators who want to put something out even if they don't have that you know cursed budget kind of feel yeah they just just that we are surrounded by so many stories is mm -hmm to me a joy because yes. I, I love stories no matter what medium they're in comic books short stories movies television shows web comics performative mm -hmm. drama <laughs> no, I, I discovered a few years ago that horror performed on stage was a thing and I went oh really tell me more <laughs> <laughs> go on <laughs> yeah so Speaking of, of storytelling, um, you know, I've mentioned that, that you're a podcast host and, you know, that's something that we don't necessarily have um, on this podcast very, very often. Um, but what got you started 
using podcasting as a creative medium? <laughs> uh, dumb luck <laughs> and being in the right place at the right time. I was uh, wandering around. What was it? I think it was the Nebula Awards uh, convention. And it had to have been 2004. Mm-hmm. And there was a, a booth outside of the dealer's room. These two guys were sitting there. And they said they had a podcast for books. And they needed book reviewers who were local. And at the time, I was in Phoenix. And I said, I like science fiction and fantasy novels and you're going to give me books so I can review them. Tell me more. (laughs) So I started out there being like a book reviewer on the dragon page and ended up joining. They had a show that was actually on AM radio. uh, And I ended up being the technical person there. And then I ended up being the producer for the show, like handling all the, Uh, scheduling and finding guests to talk to and then dragon page spun off slice of sci-fi and then I started doing more with that and eventually became part of the show while still doing the, the production stuff with the the guests and it was just it was that I enjoyed finding these people to talk to mm-hmm you know, it's the yeah. projects we're talking about and and all of that. And let's see, that was in 2005. And then in 2013, 2014, the show kind of broke up. And I literally was, you know, last woman standing. <laughs> and right. so for the show, it was gone for a year. And then I said, you know, I miss this. I miss doing this. Even though I had done other podcasts along the way um babylon podcast is one to mm-hmm. show dedicate a show only about babylon five and we did seven years of a podcast about a show that was only <laughs> on tv for five <laughs> <laughs> and uh babylon podcast had had ended though because we you know we got to the end of what we could cover and i realized right. i missed doing that so i started up slice of sci-fi again as a solo show and I've just been talking to comic book creators movie producers movie directors tv writers whoever I could talk to who was making the movies that we were watching and I got into a groove with doing indie features Mm -hmm. people who were doing indie horror indie sci-fi and they are so exciting to talk to because they are truly, truly passionate about their movies. Some of the, some of the smaller budget or indie produced sci-fi films and horror films of the past five years, I ha- have been some of my best interviews mm-hmm. and cause there's a passion and a love there. And some of these films won, you know, film festival awards, uh, took them, anywhere from one to three years to get distribution rights. So people start talking about this movie that's coming out. I'm like, wait, I talked to them three years ago when (laughs) they were doing the festival circuit. So so that was kind of cool. And just hearing the passion in their voice about their story that they got Mm -hmm. made is, you know, the, the big thing that I enjoy. So slice of sci-fi continues on. And I think about three years ago, I realized I missed talking about books and Mm -hmm. talking to authors. So I started up Writers After Dark and uh, it got off to a kind of a rocky start, (laughs) not from a production level, just just from an organizational issue because I had a lot of stuff going on with Slice of Sci-Fi and some other projects, but the, my style my approach to doing the interview is still the same. Sometimes I know a lot about the project. Sometimes I only know a little bit Mm -hmm. because I either haven't seen or haven't read the book yet. And I still like finding that question that 
I can hear the guests go, oh, wow, they know what they're talking about. And they get excited yeah. about it instead of and instead of like the normal boring uh, 10 minute radio blurb interview. I, I right. despise those. I'm like 10 minutes is not enough time to talk to anybody because you're just getting warmed up. You're just figuring out which questions you want to ask. Right. So yeah, that's for sure. I'm when, yeah, when they, when they do those, those, uh, I guess they call them radio tours or whatever. I say, can I please get more than 10 minutes? Maybe, you know, I don't care if you put me at the end of the line, it's, you know, I need 10 more minutes because this is such a cool movie and I really want to talk to the director. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, there have been a couple of times when I asked, they said, well, we can do this tomorrow and you can talk as long as you want. And I'm like, score. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's hard when you want to like get into the the gritty parts of either the creative process or the world that they built or whatever it is. And you also want, in case your, your listeners don't know who they are, you know, you, you want to give them enough of an intro that, that they're not sort of reeling for, you know, all of the, the information overload, but it's mm -hmm. finding that balance is hard. That's why I'm like, you know, 20 to 40 minutes, you know, I think, I think we can cover <laughs> in, in that usually. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> usually, usually. I, I, I aim for 20 to 30. And if I have free reign to keep going, we do. Mm -hmm. I recently did a interview with an icon, <laughs> Hollywood mm -hmm. movie making royalty. We were supposed to only talk for 30 minutes. We talked for an hour. Oh, that's awesome. We ended up going for an hour and my co-host for that episode and I ended up talking for another half an hour after that because we were so geeked. It was glorious. <laughs> <laughs> if I mention who it is, I will probably just keep geeking about it. And that's not the platform for this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I do have the, the question of like, so, so who was the, the most interesting, which is always a scary question to ask. Um, but most I interesting. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> huh. Well, the most unexpected one was that one hour one I just talked about. I talked to the guy, he's a production designer, uh, Joe Alves. He built the shark that was used in Jaws. That is cool. <laughs> yeah. And there was a that book that came out about his work on Jaws, and that's who we talked to. We talked to him and the author of the book, Dennis Prince, and we talked and talked and talked about making Jaws. And this same guy, Joe, he also worked with Spielberg on Close Encounters. He worked mm -hmm. with John Carpenter on uh, Escape from New York. And I'm like, oh, Escape <laughs> from New York. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's that's definitely one of my favorite things about being able to interview people is you sort of have the excuse to to geek out with someone who mm -hmm. maybe you're a new fan, maybe you're an old fan. Um, I, I was able to have one of my favorite authors uh, on on the podcast, and it was just like, this is a great excuse. I could just like, you know, fan at you <laughs> for, <laughs> for 40 minutes and I, hopefully I, make them awkward. <laughs> yes, there have been a couple times where I've had to hog tie my inner fangirl. Uh, I interviewed Matt Frewer a couple of years ago and I, mm -hmm. I had to tell him up ahead. I'm like, I'm going to fangirl for a minute before we start this interview, because if I don't, I'm going to just devolve into a babbling mess. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and just he, he it's not live, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can yeah. He, he, exactly. Exactly. No, he, he, he thought that was funny. And uh, <laughs> some of the most exciting interviews I had were with, uh, indie science fiction films indie thriller mm -hmm. films because they following their passion in making that movie makes for an interesting interview yeah for sure why do you think it is that you know sci-fi fantasy horror um why do you think that they're so welcoming to building fandoms and having these long lasting, like, like you said, seven years of a podcast on a show that lasted five. <laughs> <laughs> the, when, when a show connects with someone, it's either because the writing is, is top notch and the story 
connects with that person or the actors portraying those characters connect with that person. Sometimes it's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. There are, I honestly think it comes down to the story. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, some people like science fiction, some people like action. There might be some crossover, but there's usually someone leads more towards one than the other. Uh, And certain fandoms, when they realize that their love for that world, that story, or some of those characters is being acknowledged, Mm -hmm. they feel seen, they feel heard. And that is in itself a welcoming gesture. So... Mm -hmm. There's, you know, you see how people, how loyal people can get (laughs) about their fandoms. I mean, (laughs) if, if, if you ever want to start, start a bar fight, you, you say Marvel or DC and then just duck. (laughs) (laughs) Well, not all the times, but sometimes it'll, it'll devolve into a very heated discussion. And I myself am more of a Marvel girl than a DC girl. So I know where some of that uh, that protectiveness comes from, because <laughs> you're <laughs> you 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 connect with those characters, so sometimes you feel like you're defending yourself, mm-hmm. and I think that's you know that's a that's a testament to how affecting story can be, because yes. if that story wasn't any good, if that character wasn't drawn or performed to its best potential the people wouldn't have connected with it and they wouldn't be fans of it so Mm -hmm. there's story connects all of us in more ways than most of us even realize and Mm -hmm. that's what I try to explore especially on writers after dark I want to I want to find out if I can figure out where that story connection came from and how the author might want to hope that that connection moves forward in the world. And Mm -hmm. it's the same with a lot of indie movies, especially the ones that have a great premise, like a good time travel story (laughs) (laughs) can, can be messy and exciting. Uh, A good monster movie has you examining feelings you may have been trying to avoid. Uh, Mm -hmm. A good, a good action movie can have you thinking about what kind of hero is our lead character, man or woman, and what about them do I want to see in myself? Have mm-hmm. I forgotten about myself? That kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because fandom, like the, the concept of fandom, is something that I came to much, much later in my adult life. Um, you know, when, when I was growing up, I was an only child and I, I didn't have a ton of friends and my parents weren't, weren't big on, uh, you know, TV or, or movies, though I did, you know, see a few. And so it wasn't a community that I really interacted with until I was probably 18 or 19 and I, I got to college and suddenly it was like, oh my God, there's, there's this whole world, you know, most, mostly on the internet, frankly, um, and there are people who, who like the things I like and who are, you know, who feel so touched by these characters, like, like you said, you know, and it was, it was just this sort of earth shattering um, discovery for, for me that there were these people out there who were thinking and feeling the same things I was about totally fictional worlds. I will admit that my my first fandom, even though I didn't realize that's what they called it at the time, was the original <laughs> Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> All I know is I absolutely loved that show. I loved the Vipers. I wanted to own a Viper colonial warrior uniform. Mm-hmm. And I was, <laughs> you know, I was barely in high school. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I like this show. I want to be where this show is. And I looked around at the technology around me and and part of me said, you know, I'm going to have to study engineering because I can't fly a Viper right now because they don't exist. So I will build one. (laughs) (laughs) I think, I think that was most of my uh, sort of 
incentive for wanting to become an archaeologist was like, oh, well, maybe maybe I'll have an excuse to like fly a plane and, you know, get into these crazy action scenarios. And like, spo- spoiler alert, there's there's very few, <laughs> you know, during, <laughs> during actual archaeology. But it was that that drive of like, well, Indy can do it. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, Indiana Jones gets to travel the world and look for uh, lost treasures. I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. So finding finding lost cities and or, or, you know, lost pirate treasure. Totally with you there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Though it doesn't belong in a museum. It belongs to the people who made it. That's that's the new Indy. <laughs> mm hmm. So you've you've definitely seen a huge amount of of media, um, sort of ac- across the years here, and what <laughs> what trends, <laughs> um, you know, since since two thousand and four, um, I'm, I'm obviously much much longer than that. But what trends have you seen in these genres, and which ones would you like to see more of? Wow. Um, <laughs> I know that's like such a broad vague question. <laughs> it it is. I've I I think the one that I noticed but haven't quite didn't quite identify for a couple of years was the stories getting more personal. Yes. If you think about the the science fiction and the horror stories we had twenty twenty five years ago, the our heroes were acting on something or against something that had global consequences, sometimes even galactic consequences. You were, had this one hero up against an entire world, an entire other civilization, an entire uh, alien invasion. And I think the stories have gotten more personal. Mm -hmm. The, The scope of the stories is smaller, but the emotional scope of it, of them are bigger. That makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, maybe, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is, you know, like the chicken or egg kind of thing, um, but I've noticed with the trend of the grittier stories, you know, the more realistic, quote unquote, um, depending, mm-hmm. I, I think that in some ways we've seen a focus on getting deeper into the characters themselves as well, not, not just the scope of the story but also getting into who these characters are. Cause I think a lot of earlier films, you know, we, we, we know who they are, but we don't know the deep inner workings of their mind on, on the same level. And I wonder if, if that's either a cause or a um, result of changing the scope of these stories. I think it kind of goes hand in hand because mm-hmm. in order to shrink the scope, you have to look deeper into the people and their motivations for being on this adventure. Right. So you have to know more about the person to understand what they are doing, what choices they are making in this particular drama that's unfolding. Mm-hmm. And if if you just took a superficial hero in a small compact tense story it it wouldn't connect as well mm-hmm. because you're not as deeply invested in that character or or and their in those yeah and in those smaller scope stories that's what it feels like you have to you have to be able to understand that person more in order to connect with the story that they're caught up in in that moment and i guess it's made for better characters doesn't always make for better stories um unfortunately because mm-hmm. sometimes you get a really really good premise but you're still not the the people you don't you're not invested in it either right. takes way way too long to get invested in them or you never connect with them at all i mean there was a a series uh an epic fantasy series i think only the first two books of them are out so far but 
the first book was super, super hype. It's like, this is a pseudonym for a well-known author in a different genre. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the action, the battles, blah, 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 this, that, or the other will blow your socks off. And I read this book and it was well-paced. It was, uh, there was a lot of political and military intrigue going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the battles were spectacular. The, the, the magic system that was set up was, was interesting, but not one single one of the characters, none of the protagonists, none of the villains, they were all, they all felt so superficial. And I'm like, this is a wonderful world, but the people in it are just not interesting. What happened? Right. And I, I could not make sense of it. And against my better judgment, <laughs> usually <laughs> when a story doesn't connect with me, I, you know, I put it down and walk away because it's time is short <laughs> and you don't want right, to spend yeah. your time on on things that are less than entertaining or less than educational. But I forced myself to finish that book, even though I was not connecting with the characters, which meant I wasn't really enjoying it from a from a technical standpoint in terms of the techniques of writing, the structure, the story. I mean, the, the battles were exciting. The right. pacing and the betrayals and some of the reveals and the explanation of the workings of the magic system and the history of what led to these battles in that country's uh, political history, they were all interesting. But the people play acting <laughs> out these scenarios were just not. And I couldn't, like, as someone who has written stories, written mm -hmm. short stories, I have a couple of novels in my head. I've written a lot of reviews. I've written a lot of opinion pieces. Uh, I had uh, an, an, an article an essay rather published in the Battlestar Galactica collection 10 years ago. And the fact that this book could be so technically amazing, just from a, a structure standpoint, a perspective standpoint, a, an action sequence standpoint, but absolutely every single one of the characters was just <laughs> not important. I couldn't figure it out. So I had to write a review going, this is the most baffling, confounding book I have read in years. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> Just how? How do you do Because uh, Yeah, think, how did this happen? You'd think the characters would be not necessarily easy, but easier to master than, you know, the the incredible intricacies of writing technicalities and, and how you, you almost have to internalize those to a certain extent to, to get them right. And it takes decades, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but the character part, you know, for, for me, I think getting the characters is, is a little bit easier, but yeah, that's baffling would be the right word. <laughs> yeah. It, it was, it was, I was completely confounded. I couldn't figure it out. I still haven't figured it out. I mean, how do you have a book like that on an epic scale and not one single character, not even the sidekicks connected. I'm like, how does this happen? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I, I was talking to my mom who is much, she, she reads literary, historical fiction, nonfiction. Um, she doesn't really tread into the genre fiction waters very often at all. And we were discussing how you have to be so much more honest about your characters and about your observations on, on humanity when you're writing fiction and when you're writing in these fanciful worlds because that's the only thing anchoring the, the reader or the, the viewer to the world at first is, is those characters because everything else is alien probably or you know at least most of it. I don't know if the the world 
informs the building of the characters or if how the characters are creates the world around them. Some some mm-hmm. authors I've talked to go from it at that angle. Some like screenwriters, some some of the people who've written some of the indie films, they talk about, you know, this character, this idea for this character got me and I started writing about them and the world around them just sort of it came to me. You know, yeah. with certain authors, it's like I had an idea for this world and I thought about what kind of character I wanted to see in this world and then that would determine what this person's adventure would be. Some people start with the character in the quest and once they have a handle on that, they build the world around them. Some of them starts with just a weird off the wall idea and go, huh, where does this door go? (laughs) And they completely make it up. And it's, it's fun to, to explore how different people approach creating stories. I think every person is probably different to to some extent. I know for me, I'm, I'm usually a character first person, but it's character first. And then I just go through a series of what if and why questions and, and eventually that kind of shakes out into, into a world, Mm -hmm. but, but it really is a combination. I think it's just depends on the ratio perhaps. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, I think that's part of my own personal sticking point when it comes to Mm -hmm. writing novel length stories. I think maybe I'm meant to do movies anyway, but Mm -hmm. I can see a character in my head and I can see that they're dealing with the emotional fallout of something. Mm-hmm. And I sort of just follow their path. And as they encounter the world around them, I see the world around them being built. And for some reason, it's easier to sustain that in a shorter story than it is in a novel. It's, it's tougher for me to right. get a handle on other characters that would surround Mm -hmm. this person in a longer story so i'm working on that (laughs) i mean writing short fiction is so incredibly different i mean i i do both and i like to think i I do both serviceably Um, (laughs) but it's it's a completely different process for for me um and, and maybe that's just a, a genre thing as well, because I I write sci-fi differently than I write fantasy. Um, I, you know, my, my process is just, I guess, different, both genre and, and, and length. But the formula is so completely different. And I remember someone, I don't know, I was going around the internet at some point, someone made a, a judgment call about how, like, well, writing a screenplay must be so much easier than writing a novel because it's shorter or <laughs> fewer words. And I, like, I've never attempted to write a screenplay, and I don't think I could ever attempt to write a screenplay. But just that that idea is like, no, it's going to be completely different and therefore just as difficult. Mm-hmm. It's it's from my experience because I have I have done a little bit of both. The screenplay is easier and harder. Mm -hmm. The screenplay, you don't have to build. You have to be concise in -hmm. your building, but a lot of the extraneous exposition that you would feel compelled to put into a novel, you can't put in a screenplay. Right. you're, You're building a roadmap to making a movie, not building, uh, you know, you're not building Westeros here. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's the set designer's problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. The, uh, the, at how it, how it looks is you, you need to build a little bit so the people reading the screenplay can go, okay, yeah, I see how this could work uh, as a film. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. And, but in a novel, you you have more space, I guess, is could be the right word. Yeah. But they're both equally hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually looked into starting playing around with screenplays uh, just because I was having so much trouble with novels. And 
it turns out some of my short stories are better suited to being screenplay. So I'm working on that a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> all of all of us creatives have like 20 projects that are overlapping, but not not at all the same, oh. I've found. <laughs> yeah. Only only 20? <laughs> right. <laughs> 20 at once, you know. <laughs> ah. Um, yeah. So speaking of, of different projects here, um, when we were off air, you mentioned that you've sort of stuck your, your toes in the narration waters, um, which is something that I find really fascinating. And I I also stuck my toe in and then promptly pulled my toe back out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm, I'm just I'm just fascinated by that. Yeah, the it I fell into doing the narrations by accident. Uh, somebody who ran a short story podcast, I'm going to say in 2008 or 2009, he he said he liked my voice on mm-hmm. uh, it was either Slice of Sci-Fi or Babylon podcast. I don't remember which. And he said, "Do you ever did you ever consider doing a narration?" I'm like, "Yeah," because you know people have told me that doing a story narration was was fun and like my voice had that quality that some people like in audiobooks and and mm-hmm. if I would give it a try and the book uh I didn't do a book I did a short story and uh what was it I think it was going through changes by Pat Murphy was the very okay. first one I did and I loved that story and it turned out they loved the way I read that story. So for a while I was getting like maybe one or two stories a year and I loved reading the stories and then figuring out the voice of the character Mm -hmm. and doing different pitches, different tones for like if for multiple characters was a challenge at first, but you kind of get into it. And one of the, I did a Christmas story for a a crime fiction podcast that sadly is no longer (laughs) online, but the author emailed and said she was laughing the whole time. She, she thought the narration was delightful. I don't know if you could find the story out there, but it's called grammar got run over by a reindeer. (laughs) (laughs) The, the, the main character is a, is a teacher. It's an English teacher. That's great, <laughs> and, and the story that it's she she figures she's like a, a an amateur detective kind of thing, and she figures mm-hmm. out a crime has been committed based on uh, the speech patterns and word choices of someone who is really impersonating somebody else, and they figure it out. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is hilarious. That's fine, and. I just, I want to try my hand. Yeah, it is. It's when you, when you get a really, really cool story, it's fun to, to just immerse yourself in it and play act those characters. Mm -hmm. But I want to try my hand at at longer stuff in audiobooks for a while was harder to get into. I think now it might be a little looser to get into, but I'm, I'm still trying, but I'm still doing, um, the short the short stories uh, mostly recently i've been doing a lot of stuff for tales to terrify and starship sofa mm-hmm. and <laughs> they have a tendency to give me the stories with the weird vocabulary <laughs> there's always that. Uh, mm-hmm. not that i'm complaining they they're fun but it's one of those things where you see the words and you go, oh, no, you're going to have to send me a pronunciation guide and I'm going to have to work with this for a bit. Why are there three apostrophes in the middle of one word? <laughs> <laughs> Backwards accent marks on right. words with two vowels that are ten letters long. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I, I've noticed with as, as I sort of develop my writing... Uh, you know, I, writing fantasy, there's sort of the, the conventions of these long, elaborate names with multiple apostrophes and various other mm-hmm. accents. And and I definitely have that, but <laughs> my nicknames for my characters get shorter and shorter with each book. <laughs> it's like, I, I can't have 20 characters with, like, the same 10 letters sort of shuffled around into 
into little you know three three letter names like it's that in and of itself mm-hmm. might get confusing Unless, too <laughs> yeah and 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 if you play the quintuplets game where they're all like you know rhyming or yeah. <laughs> have the same start first letter and you know half halfway through the second book your 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 reader is going who which 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 sibling is this again <laughs> I'm I'm not allowed to name characters with names that start with A anymore. Um, it's just <laughs> with band. Um, <laughs> I ran into some issues because I was, of course, naming people after their their great grandfathers or whatever. It's like, okay, now let's let's get some creativity in here because it's gonna it's gonna get complicated. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a subway commercial out now that's like that the mom is giving the the sandwiches out it's like tuna for tj turkey for jj and then the two boys look at each other and goes no it's you know this for jj Mm -hmm. this for tj and then the mom has this 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 tired look on her face and going that's why we named your other brother Derek." oh my gosh yeah I, i love i love nicknaming stuff and and naming conventions because I mean in on, on one hand it's just a name, but on the other hand, because you're actually able to to choose it with the character in mind, you know, as opposed to a parent trying to name this squalling pink raisin something that's, you know, <laughs> supposed to be meaningful. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do like to, to get into what names mean. But again, as as I've gone on, it's like this sounds fine and it doesn't rhyme with like the other characters on page with them most of the time so let's just let's just run with that Mm -hmm. i have a i have a couple of character naming reference books and i have on several occasions gone down the what should i name this person rabbit hole and Mm -hmm. there was even a, a a story that is still in outline sort of treatment format uh where i went through the entire thing and i'm like you know what I really don't like that name for this guy. <laughs> Went back and changed his name. So I had to change all the, the, <laughs> the indicators throughout. I think I had written like 40 pages of a, um, of a treatment of an outline of it from beginning to end. I'm like, yeah, no, this name isn't working for me. I got to do something else. So <laughs> yeah, names are important. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did end up as sort of like a, a nod to some of my first beta readers. Um, one of their favorite characters had his name changed um, before the, the book ultimately came out and his son ends up using that as his nickname uh, much later on in the series. I was like, that's, that's my little homage to you guys. <laughs> I'm sorry that, that your favorite character got his name changed, but here we are. <laughs> so what is, is next for you? Um, cause obviously you have, you have all these projects and they're all very exciting, but what, what are you planning for the rest of the chaos that is 2020? <laughs> the only I way we haven't the finest, yeah, chaos, rolling chaos. I have no idea. Um, I'm just going to keep scheduling interviews for, you know, both slice of sci-fi and writers after dark, looking for more interesting projects, uh, to to talk about um stuff that there's some historical stuff that ties into new movies coming out Mm -hmm. that i'm looking into seeing if i can find those old creators and talking to them uh trying to expand the pool of of writers i talk to in writers after dark um trying to get more comics writers on Oh, and yeah. branch out into playwrights and you know more screenwriters because those are stories too and mm-hmm. um let's see what else like i said still submitting uh demos for uh audiobooks for mm-hmm. other other things looking for looking for work that relates to podcasting because that's that's what i've been doing lately well it's it's hard to to monetize them i think like it's it's such a strange field 
It is. It's. It's. You know. And and we tried monetizing slice of sci-fi long ago. It didn't didn't work out quite so well. But there seem to be more and more people looking for people with podcast experience to help them create their own corporate podcasts. Mm-hmm. And I used to say, hmm, 15 years as a podcast producer and host right here. <laughs> and so we'll see if, if that works out. But the one cool thing is I, I also am a audio producer for a short story podcast called escape pod which is also 15 years old yeah they do they do science fiction (laughs) short stories and escape pod was nominated for a hugo award this year and oh my god my name is on the ballot too (laughs) oh my god that's so exciting congratulations (laughs) Uh, i was just going ah my name is on a hugo ballot oh my really (laughs) so i i remember when when archive of our own was um was nominated like the entire website was nominated and like all of the authors who had had written fan fiction were just like do do i get to put that in my bio now (laughs) yes you do (laughs) (laughs) it's like technically yes it's it's a little complicated but sure (laughs) yep it is and you know i uh when i think the awards happen in august but i i'm gonna get a little hugo nominated pin so Mm -hmm. i'm like oh my god really seriously so that'll be cool that's that's one hell of a bucket list to to check off Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's exciting yep yep so where can my listeners find you uh slice of sci-fi.com is probably the easiest way to find me or you know the slice of sci-fi podcast uh writers after dark uh i don't tweet as much for writers after dark as i do for slice of sci-fi mm-hmm. uh i tweet a lot these days <laughs> uh from the babylon podcast because babylon 5 is back on the air again for i don't know for how long uh started in 2018 the end of 2018 and i've been tweeting up a storm mm-hmm. and 20, 2019 was the 25th anniversary of Babylon 5. So we fired up the podcast after a seven year hiatus <laughs> and did uh, 10 episodes for the anniversary. We talked to a couple of people we hadn't talked to during that first seven year run. And that was glorious. It was, that's we, cool. We got to talk to some of you know the iconic characters. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, Twitter, at Slice of Sci-Fi, or at Babylon Podcast uh, is where you can find me most of the time. Mm-hmm. Or just come on over to SliceofSciFi.com, listen to an episode, uh, listen to, I think we have some old, like we have book reviews, move, we have book reviews on Writers After Dark, uh, we have TV and movie reviews and sci-fi commentary horror commentary on slice of sci-fi so Mm -hmm. yeah leave a comment on the website uh tweet at me on twitter (laughs) (laughs) yes twitter is a is a raging dumpster fire but it gives me solace knowing that so many other people are going looking around going what in the world (laughs) (laughs) yeah twitter's twitter's my like my favorite of the social media um despite being a dumpster fire. Um, I, I've definitely found an incredible community there. Um, we're all burning together. Yes. So that's exciting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, 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 the support on Twitter, like the, the comics book, comic books, people, the artists, the illustrators, they all support each other. It's, it's wonderful. The horror authors, mm-hmm. the horror movie uh, people all, all just, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder the the sci-fi geeks even even the marvel and dc yeah fans, they they're just so so genuine most yeah. of them and they are fierce in defending <laughs> their fans and their their fandoms so that's 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 the joy i take out of twitter yes yeah for sure it's um I think it's one of the best parts about the internet is the ability to find your your fellow fans and, and your community and 
<sighs> it's probably why I spend too much time on there. Yeah, that's true. That's that's, <laughs> that's usually my my morning. I'm like, all right, you're like pry yourself away from the internet. Thank you so much for for joining me, and it was it was so much fun to to talk about fandom and podcasting, and it's it's nice to get out of the uh, the author mindset sometimes and sort of broaden it to creators in in general and see the the differences and parallels. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. And like I said, podcasting has allowed me to talk to such a wide, wide mm -hmm. range of creators, different creators and different mediums. And I think that has been what has kept me going so long. Yes, for sure. This has been the Amphibian Press podcast. I'm V.S. Holmes. And with me today was podcaster Summer Brooks. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>